Hey everybody, Michael Snyder, Pacific Northwest Weather Watch. Today we're going to do Pacific Northwest windstorm introduction. After the introduction, we'll do a case study look at one of these storms today. I want to do a multi-video series here where I can dedicate individual videos to individual storms. We'll go over the biggest and baddest Pacific Northwest windstorms to hit the region here in the last 50 plus years. Now, jumping right into things here, these windstorms are not uncommon. The big ones are more uncommon, though. They can be every one, every 10, 15, 20, 50 years. Some of the return intervals on some of these storms is probably over 100 years. So you just kind of hope you're not around when the big one hits. But as you can see here, these typhoons across the Pacific Ocean here are often generators of energy that come into the Pacific Northwest. You bring this subtropical and tropical warm air and it interacts with very cold air in a trough off the coast of North America. You can cast a very powerful gradient across the region here and really bring some powerful windstorms into the area here. Now, taking a look here, this is October 24th, 2021, the big bomb cyclone. You probably remember if you're in the area last year, just showing that these storms can rival category three or even greater hurricanes in their wind speeds and their central pressure. They're usually much larger as well, and they affect, their, affect a much bigger area also, all the way down from the Bay Area in California, well up into British Columbia as well. A single storm can go over a thousand miles up the coastline of North America. Now, taking a look here, um, like I mentioned, windstorms are fairly consistent here across Pacific Northwest. For example, I've been recording all the storms that occur here in the central Puget Sound. There have been 84 in 10 years, and they come like clockwork each year. The big ones, however, are much more elusive, but sometimes they can come more than once a decade. So now taking a look at some Native American thoughts on windstorms in the past. This is before settlers got here. They knew that the winds were stronger at the coastline. They also knew that these storms came in during the winter months. And they had totem poles that would explain the phenomena as by a thunderbird dropping down into the ocean, picking up a whale, and it had to flap its wings really hard, and that would cause the windstorm. So kind of an interesting explanation there as to why the windstorms occurred. Now, taking a look here, this is when settlers arrived, January 1880. This storm is known as the Storm King, one of the greatest storms to ever hit the Pacific Northwest. You can see we only have observations to go on. We don't have any meteorological data from this time frame here. You can see the path the storm probably took here. And you can see some of the damage the winds did. You can imagine these structures not well built at the time. Some of these homes are not well built. There's lots of sheds. Even the buildings in the cities were just simply not that well built in 1880. And you can see the huge amounts of snow this storm dumped on the north side. Very interesting there. But back in this day, you couldn't just go on your home computer and check out the satellite imagery. You couldn't look at weather models. And if you were lucky, somebody might have had a barometer that could see the pressure falling. But that would happen between five five and 15 times every season. And you could never predict this kind of monster moving on shore. And as you can see here, some of these areas, just hundreds of trees down and, you know, a lot more trees around the area back then before we settled the area. So that was the problem for the settlers. And they found out in a very rude way here from the 1880 storm King back in January of 1880. Now, taking a look at some other problems here with windstorms, soil saturation. November 2006, for example, was extremely wet, 15 plus inches at SeaTac. So the entire area is really well saturated. Then we have a huge windstorm move through in December and just really enhance the tree falls across the area. Summer drought can do it as well, as well as insects, clear cutting of forest areas. The farther we go out into the foothills and cut down trees, the more wind run can get going here. And then if you thin out trees in forest areas, the canopy becomes more susceptible to falling trees. And then every year we get power outages. Carbon monoxide poisoning causes deaths in the big windstorms as well. We need to communicate that better across the Pacific Northwest because every single big event we have people dying in carbon monoxide poisoning events. Fatalities due to falling trees is the big one. Just the branches from a Douglas fir can easily kill you. Power lines get down by these trees. People get electrocuted. So th these are things we have to watch. And the next big windstorm, you know, I just kind of worry about the uh, location. We've got so many areas that have built out into the rural areas that I just kind of wonder about how many trees are going to come down. And hopefully people, you know, hopefully can avoid unnecessary fatalities. Now taking a look at this, this is blowdowns. This is a storm that knocks down 1 billion or more board feet of timber. And as the great Wolf Reed says, no hurricane in history, no matter how strong, managed to knock down as much forest as the Great Gale of 1962. Wolf Reed is the, the 
foremost mind here across Pacific Northwest as far as windstorms. He's done tremendous research on it. And in one of these videos coming up here, I'll go ahead and link some of his work. He gave me permission to use some of his work off his website. He's a very great resource to have here in the Pacific Northwest. Now, take a look at blowdowns in recorded history on the topic here. January 20, 1921, 1934, 1951, and of course, the Columbus Day Storm, 11 to 15 billion board feet of timber blown down. Strangely enough, it's been 60 years now. We have not had another blowdown across Pacific Northwest, not even the great 1995 December storm probably blew down, you know, maybe a few hundred million board feet of timber, but did not reach that elusive 1 billion board feet of timber that to, re, uh, you know, to get to that um, blow down criteria. Now, this is something that's important to realize here across Pacific Northwest. You really got to understand your location. Certain areas are more susceptible to high winds and impacts will be different. Of course, winds are stronger over water and shorelines. The windstorm is going to seem more intense depending on where you are. When you have water around, there's less friction. There's no trees, no, no hills to knock that wind down or slow it down. Now, if you live in sheltered areas, the trees also become sheltered. Those trees will become affected by slower wind speeds. So when you get these big wind storms blasting through, for example, the inauguration day storm in 1993, it really roared through into the foothills pretty well, example, up towards Auburn and out towards Enumclaw, and it really downed a lot of trees. And of course, if you're on a ridge or an exposed area, mountaintops, the wind's going to be stronger there too. So know your location, know what your risks are. And even if you're not in an area that's directly affected by the windstorm, you can run into fallen trees, power outages, you know, supply disruptions, all kinds of stuff can happen. So know where you are and know what the threats are. And of course, beware the trees. I want to harp on that again. Anybody that's new here to the Pacific Northwest, if you haven't been here for the 2006 storm, you, I really can't overestimate what damage these trees can do and just how disruptive they can be across the area. Now, looking here, we these trees can average 130 feet tall. So you can imagine how much they weigh and the reach when they do fall. Uh, so that's the average height across the region here. And a wise man once said, your proximity to the trees likely determines your thoughts on the power of a Pacific Northwest windstorm. And if the falling trees don't get you the six inch diameter branches, it sheds might. I know that kind of seems kind of morbid. But every single year we get people that are killed by branches and trees. You've you really got to pay attention when the wind starts blowing here in the Pacific Northwest. So now looking at a case study here, 1993, immediately some of you have been along here a long time are going to know what I'm talking about here. This is the great inauguration day storm event. You can see Seattle, Pacific Ocean. There's Honolulu, Tokyo. Here's China. What we're watching for here is this tropical moisture off the coast of China. And you can kind of see this come up off of Tokyo. And then you can see this great wave move across the ocean here here it comes and it breaks right on the pacific northwest january 20th 1993 so you can see this precipitable water even back in 1993 we have these records to watch these systems move across the ocean here we can pinpoint the exact area where this storm originated and then slam to the pacific northwest a full week later now as we look a little bit closer here, here's that subtropical moisture down here. Not even really much of anything going on here, just kind of off the south shore of China, south of Taiwan here. And you can kind of see that system move up off the coast of Japan. No big deal here. Probably, you know, this is probably causing some pretty stormy activity across Japan, but nothing that they probably would remember after a few years or whatnot. You can see the system come off the coast of Japan here. Start to move northeast to Tokyo. And you can see it here now on the Pacific Ocean view. And you see the huge trough that's set up here across the Gulf of Alaska. This means trouble, folks. So as we look closely here, you can see a portion of that energy break off, start to round the base of this trough. And look at this. This is bad news. It's aimed right at the Pacific Northwest here. As you get a little closer, here's the parent low over the Gulf of Alaska here. And you can see the smaller, weaker low for now off the coast of Oregon. But soon the student becomes the master as this thing takes over the low pressure, even beats out its parent low here to the north. And this thing really takes the perfect track along the northwest Oregon coast 
through the Puget Sound. Greatest pressure grading ever recorded between Seattle and Portland. Tremendous winds raked the area here, caused, I believe, six deaths across the region here. Over 700,000 people were out of power. Now, looking at the satellite imagery here, you can see the bent back occlusion, the most powerful part of these windstorms. Extreme pressure rise up the Puget Sound on the back side of this. Uh, you can see kind of the low resolution satellite imagery we had back in 1993. But I'm just kind of grateful that we have any satellite imagery of all about this storm. Now, taking one more look at that, just you got to kind of marvel at just the perfect placement of this powerful gradient as it just drug up the Puget Sound here. And then you can see it moved into British Columbia and started to weaken eventually, but it did bring some strong winds up through Northwest Washington into BC as well. Now, I actually was going to Green River Community College. It's now just Green River College, but there were trees blocking the campus. It took hours to get off the campus. And at home, I had personally had no power for five days at the apartments that I lived in just north of Green River there. It was just, uh, it was becoming a nightmare. I mean, it was pretty cold after the inaugural day storm went in and we were getting mixed rain and snow and I was having to take cold showers at home. But it was incredible. For weeks after the, uh, the inauguration day storm, oh, there were flatbed trucks that would just be bringing cars that had been totaled and you could tell they'd been smashed by trees and Green River Community College was no exception to that. I watched fully healthy Douglas fir, huge trees, break off and falling repeatedly on the campus there. It was extremely dangerous. And I still, to this day, don't know how anybody was not killed at the college, although people were killed around the college. Now, taking a look here, power poles snapped, for example, 700,000 plus residents with no power, six people killed by the falling trees, two were indirectly, one by a heart attack and one by electrocution. So I think four were killed by the falling trees themselves, if I'm uh, correct with that data there. Now, again, perfectly tracked storm for damaging winds in the Puget Sound. Renton, Washington, an incredible 74 miles per hour. Boeing Field with 70 miles per hour, stronger than what recorded in the Columbus Day storm, 66 miles per hour. Tillamook, almost 100 miles per hour. Incredible wind gusts, 72 at Astoria. Strongest pressure gradient, like I said, ever. Portland to Seattle. SeaTac's one hour, 6.2 millibar pressure rise is the fastest ever recorded at SeaTac. Just an incredible pressure rise. And that just shows just how powerful the winds were moving through the area. 67 miles per hour at Everett, Washington. And this kind of wind speed is probably a one in 50 year event for Boeing Field in Seattle. So inauguration day storm, first wind storm we're going over here. We're going to go over several more here. I'll, do, I'll just um, dedicate individual videos to some of these big wind storms because there's so much to talk about. And of course, I don't want to ruin it for anybody, but I think everybody knows what number one is. If you don't, just don't spoil it for yourself. It'll be fun to go over. And it's going to be fun to go over anyway because there's so much data on some of these storms. And there's so many personal stories from some of the people here that lived across Pacific Northwest. My mom is in her 70s now and she remembers the Columbus Day storm, for example. And I've talked to some other people that have dealt with it as well. But there are there are several books that have been written about that storm. There have been scientific papers written about it as well. And there are some other really impressive storms out there, like the Hanukkah Eve storm, the December 1995 storm. There was a storm in 1958, 1951. There was really some impressive storms back in the 20s and 30s as well. And we'll go over some of those storms in great detail coming up here. So I hope you guys like this video. Leave some comments on what else you think I could go over. I'll be doing both weather models and just kind of um, personal stories and just going over some of the data and some of the incredible information that come in from these stories. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoy this video. I'll be working on the next one coming up here. It's probably going to be a six or seven video series here. So I'll do its own playlist on YouTube there. And we're dealing with our own active weather right now. And so I'll do another video tomorrow morning, uh, October 22nd. So I will talk to you guys then. And I will let you know when the next video comes out as far as windstorms go. So leave me some comments below and I will talk to you guys later.